ready? I guess we should really get people um, to get people to walk. To a bit closer together, but you know, it's fine. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for being here. Yeah. Is it working? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for being here in this panel about science fiction and comics, which is a very small topic. <laughs> Um, we are here with uh, Irina Rasheta. Rasheta. Uh, she is a translator. Uh, she studied history and Spanish language in Zagreb University. Uh, she currently works um, mostly as a digital marketer in the financial industry, but she has translated many comic books uh, from Spanish into uh, Croatian and books in general from English into, into Croatian. She is very active in the Croatian sci-fi uh, scene and has organized many, many, many conventions in her home country. Uh, she also has written a short story collection called Cabron. <laughs> and uh, she has co-authored uh, the first Croatian book in digital marketing, social media, and content marketing. And of course, uh, we have Richard Morgan, who doesn't need an introduction, of course, but I will introduce <laughs> him anyway, very briefly, because everyone knows who he is. He's a rock star. And uh, <laughs> he studied history at the Queen's College in Cambridge. He started teaching English. Not very hard. Not very hard. <laughs> uh, he traveled the world, and uh, in 2002, he wrote his first novel, Altered Carbon which was very successful, and uh, it allowed him to become a full-time writer. Is it right? Yeah. Uh, he has written several books. Uh, he has written two six-issues Black Widow miniseries for Marvel comic books. Uh, what else? Also has been a writer for video games. And he's currently working, I hope I'm not wrong, <laughs> on a tr trilogy uh, with a gay um, main character. Is that right? No, that's finished. Yeah. It's finished. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's they, I have to t t tell Wikipedia they don't know. <laughs> 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 and uh, what else? Ah, of course, he won the Philip K. Dick Award for Altered Carbon. And I will not um, continue with the presentation. Just let us go ahead. Okay, um, before we came here, uh, we were discussing many things I wish we would have discussed here because they were interesting. <laughs> so um, this panel, is, um, we try to include all of you in this panel. So please, uh, yeah, throw so your questions. We're hoping that you have a lot of interesting things to ask us about comics and science fiction. Um, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because Otherwise, you know, it will be comics and science fiction. Yes. <laughs> and then, so uh, we, we'd like you to have a think about anything you'd like to ask us, really, I think, because that works better. Um, we'll give you a little bit of time for that. Um, first of all, um, Blanca is going to surprise me with a couple of questions that I have no earthly uh, knowledge of prior to uh, sitting down, <laughs> honest. And, uh, and while we're doing that, uh, yeah, if you guys want to have a think about comics, science fiction, the relationship between the two of them, you know, what relationship that is, uh, why it interests you, why you're sitting here, uh, you know, and if you don't have an answer, then you'll be able to, be able to go. Um, yeah, so now you're warned. Okay. Um, so you have worked in several media as a book writer and comic book writer and, and uh, game uh, writer. How do you think they interact? Well, that, that, does, that depends a lot on the, the, the franchise in question. I mean, I, it's true, I, when I was working for, for Electronic Arts and Crytek, I wrote a comic book that was supposed to parallel the, uh, the, the game story of Crisis 2. Um, I don't know how successful that was. I mean, I enjoyed writing it, but uh, it was a strictly a marketing tool. And uh, I think when you have this cross-media thing, it, it, it can be quite soulless sometimes because it, it can be a case of we just need to market the product in a variety of different ways and, and you, you go on and produce us. It's good for people like us because it gives work to creatives. Um, but I think 
it's a much more difficult thing to have that kind of soul across across a whole set of stuff. I mean, Black Widow, for example, uh, which was the thing that Marvel gave for me to do, that wasn't tied to anything. Uh, she was, in fact, in in a box at the time. I mean, no one was really reading Black Widow. There weren't any Black Widow stories around. The previous graphic novel had been a few years previously. Apparently, hadn't you know hadn't really done very well, and. It was, yes, it was a bolt out of the blue. Uh, I was just approached and someone said, to the, the, the uh, editor in question, Jenny Lee, who had read Altered Carbon and really liked it, mainly because she liked the female characters. So she approached me and said, would I like to write this, this Black Widow character? And I, I didn't know anything about her. And I just said, yeah, yeah, I did, tell me about her. And so they explained who the Black Widow was. And do you all know who the Black Widow is? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they um, they explained the Black Widow to me, and I just went, "Oh yes, that's that'll be brilliant." There's there's so much to mine in here, you know. It's a, the the sort of the Soviet past, the 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 kind of clash of 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 uh, philosophies between this this old guard socialism that uh, supposedly is where she's from, and then the fact that she chooses to leave that behind and cross over into the capitalist West, and um, the whole issue of the fact that it's a female in the role of a superhero, and uh, there were so many things you could turn on their heads and do interesting things with. Uh, I just jumped at the chance, yes, yes, I'll do that one. And Jenny Lee says, yeah, are you sure? Are you sure? Um, I mean, this should give you some sense of how much Black Widow was not a functional IP really at the time. She said, are you sure? We have got other stuff. So I said, all right, well, there's, what other stuff have you got? So she said, oh, well, we've got, uh, there's this thing called Ghost Rider. And I'm going, okay, so you told me about Ghost Rider. So she said, well, Ghost Rider, he's like, he used to be a motorcycle uh, stuntman and he wears this leather suit, but he has a flaming skull for a head. Okay, let's go back to Black Widow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> though interestingly enough, I turned Ghost Rider down, Garth Ennis took it on instead and turned it into a very, very lucrative uh, IP where they made two movies with um, Nicolas Cage in. And, you know, so I kind of missed the boat there a bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, I think the point with, with um, me coming on board to do the Black Widow was that Instantly, I was aware that we were going to need science fictional tropes in order for this to work. Uh, and it struck me, the more I looked at the material, the past material, it struck me that this had always been the case. And I think, you know, there, there is a definite link uh, between science fiction and fantasy, I think, the two, really, and the, the way comic books tend to work. And I say tend to because not all work this way. And that is that it, comic books are a very dynamic, visceral narrative form, generally. Um, they, it, you, know, you do not get the same visceral kick from a, from a novel, a prose novel, usually, because it's just not possible to convey the same punch with a, with, um, a page of prose. Uh, you can try, I do try. Uh, but ultimately, if you turn the page of a comic and there's a splash panel and it's well done, uh, it will hit you in the face in a way that prose just doesn't. Um, now, so what you've got is a kind of supercharged narrative form. And the supercharger for that tends to be uh, either magic or future tech, uh, which we may as well call magic because, you know, they, they, they work much in much the same way. That's what allows you to do the cool things that make the comic book form in its, in its, very, in its very mainstream sense work. And if you look at anything that's coming out of the, the, the Western comics industry at the moment, what you'll find is, yeah, everywhere you look, there is either some form of magic or there is a, and supernatural beings, or there is some form of, of high tech uh, and usually a tech that is so advanced that it might as well be magic. Um, so I think that that's the, you know, th this is the dynamic. It's the supercharger we use to tell these kind of stories. It doesn't apply to all um, sequential arti artistic narrative. Um, we, there are a few others, we'll, we'll probably get to those later. But I'm going to then question whether those actually count as comic books or not. Uh, so it should be a bit of a point of contention there. <laughs> so would you like to ask something to Irina? Or Yeah, um, of the stuff that you translated, which were your favourites? <laughs> um, of course, uh, because everybody here is to listen to me, I'm going to keep this short. Um, well, I gr actually grew up reading comics uh, in ex-Yugoslavia, and I grew up reading comics like, um, you probably never heard of it, Machu Picchu by Radovan Devlić or uh, Alan Ford. It's an Italian comic book that's uh, mostly, mostly regarded as a cult comic book in, in Croatia, in ex-Yugoslavia. And um, 
I did uh, read comic books like Star Wars or um, Dylan Dog or uh, Zagor or something like that, but not, not so much. Fast forward into the future, I started translating comic books because I studied Spanish in, in Zagreb University. I uh, translated Spanish, uh, from Spanish. And I translated uh, actually big comic books uh, that had words, number of words, like uh, mostly like novels, not like uh, small comic books from, from the North America. Uh, like Eternauta, Alvar Mayor. Uh, I also translated some comic books from Al Al Alfonso Font. He is a Spanish mm -hmm. uh, comic book author. So that's that's my background in comic books. Reading, mm -hmm. fan, big fan of comic but, books, but and when translating. When you were doing the translating, which ones did you like best? I mean, which was the, the sort of the most satisfying? Uh... Uh, I think as my major accomplishment was translating Eternauta, which had like it, it was like a big novel. <laughs> <laughs> when when I finish, because it has like yeah, a zillion words in it, so it, it's it's my best accomplishment yet in translating. <laughs> okay. So anyone has? Does a anybody have any questions? Hi, I have like two questions, so I don't know what sort of like the etiquette is. So Just go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, so um, the first question is going to be like very short. So um, in your line of work of trans translation, uh, what is the process like? Because you already have these predetermined bubbles and for instance, for languages that are not Western, our words tend to be longer. So how do you kind of like overcome this uh, problem of space? Yeah, you have to be very creative. You have to have... <laughs> <laughs> you have a definite, definite number of words per bubble and you have to uh, make it in it. So, and it was very, actually it was very difficult for me translating from Spanish because Spanish words tend to be also very big. Uh, they, uh, and the major difference was because Spanish has like a um, million synonyms and Croatian does not. So there would be like panels and sorry if anybody is young here or minor, there were panels like old panel with uh, words like uh, whore with, in, in a gazillion uh, variations in Spanish and we have like five, so you have to be very creative with, with that one. And, but you know, um, when you get the hang of it, you, you just do it. And um, it's more like, it's not translating literally, it's more like, you, you know, when they translate poems, they're also making another poem, so I was kind of, uh, for me, <laughs> making comics like that. Well, it must have been quite satisfying though, because it's very creative. Yes, it, it is. It's very challenging, you know. Yeah. People think, oh, you're just translating comics, but it's not. It's very, very difficult just to put everything back the way it was. Yeah. Okay, and the second question is, um, because usually when you think about speculative comics, it usually boils down to DC versus Marvel, and they kind of like compete uh, and take over all the attention with the superhero genre taking off. So um, what's it like for, because I'm not very knowledgeable about other publishers and markets that don't do um, quite this, so like, Studios like Boom and Image, where do they fit? And can indie comics also kind of like find a niche? And what's the situation there? Is what I'm curious about. Well, um, the first thing to say here is that my knowledge is considerably out of date. Uh, the last time I, w I mean, I worked for Marvel ten years ago. Um, I think I, ra I wrapped up the second uh, graphic novel of of um, Black Widow in 2006. So it is exactly 10 years ago. I have done comic book work since, but as I said, it was part of the, the stuff I did for Crisis was, I really had very little to do with anything except the actual writing. I mean, I literally just wrote it. I gave it to the guys from Electronic Arts and they took it away. They did a deal with, I think it was ID, um, and ID then bundled it. And it was, you know, that, that I had very little connection with that, so I don't know much about that. Um, so yeah, I, when I was working there, uh, yeah, you did. They were the two huge combines, basically, um, Marvel and DC. Uh, Marvel were really nice to work for. I mean, professional 
up front. They, you know, um, you submit your invoice, you get paid. Every, bang on the nail every time. Get it in by this date. Your money will arrive by this date. Uh, that was brilliant. They they flew me out to Comic Con in San Diego because there were, I was getting. I wasn't selling many copies, but I was getting a good buzz from the series. We got good reviews in Entertainment Weekly and places like that. Um, you know, they were really nice to me. Um, you know, despite the fact that the, the, the numbers were falling almost from the start of the series. Um, but in the end, they pulled the plug before we could complete the whole. You know, I, I, I wrote two graphic novels. There was a third one begging to be written, um, and they just went, ah, no, uh, <laughs> because in the end, they're about the bottom line. And I think this is largely because Marvel had a really shitty time um, in the sort of late '80s, early '90s. They nearly went under. Uh, they nearly went went into bankruptcy. And they got turned around. The team that turned them around just became very hard nosed and said, "Right, we must sell comics because that's what we're about." And so basically, yeah, what I heard from other guys working for Marvel was, sell 50 to 100,000 copies of, each, of an issue, they'll leave you alone and let you do what you want. Uh, but if you don't, then, then it becomes, they start to think about whether they, whether they want to cancel you or not, and the content becomes very important. Vertigo was a whole other story. And again, I, my experience is all secondhand. I didn't actually work for Vertigo, but I was told that I should. Um, <laughs> Because Vertigo didn't seem to care very much about the numbers. I, I'm not sure because they were... I think what, I, what one very cynical writer told me, and I'm not going to tell you who it was, um, was that because they made so much money from Batman lunchboxes, um, they just didn't care. <laughs> and um, and, and they, the people who, who edited were interested in stories and they wanted to see what, you know, what was fresh, what was cool, what was exciting. Um, and so they basically would just go, yeah, the lunchboxes will pay for this. And, and, uh, and so, for example, I'll give you a case in point. I mean, as I said, Black Widow, we started on about 45,000 copies because everyone was curious to see what, what this was about. It's like, oh, Black Widow, yeah, yeah, I remember her, let's, let's see. And over the course of six issues, I managed to drag it down from 45,000 copies to 25 or something or thereabouts. It's quite an achievement. Um, <laughs> and... Um, they gave me a second series, I, I mean, you know, which was crazy in itself, but they gave me a second series because the press had been so good, because the reviews were good. That one bumped back up again, and we, we came in at about 32, 33,000, something like that, I think. And then I managed to drag it all the way down to under 20,000 copies, uh, at which point they just went, ah, really, Richard, it's, thank you very much, but you can, you can go now. Um, <laughs> When I, I ran into Mike Carey at, uh, at another Comic Con, and uh, we were talking about this, and he said, 20,000 copies? Hmm, I don't think Lucifer ever sold more than about 25,000. And apparently, the individual issues of Lucifer, yeah, 25, maybe 30,000 at most, but Vertigo didn't care. Um, and, and of course, what they did was they made a lot of money on the graphic novels, and, um, you know, and it became a cult thing. But, so what I understood from that was that Vertigo were much more laid back uh, but then Vertigo had n not been close to receivership. You know, that was the point. Marvel had seen the abyss. And, and we were like, fuck that, we're not going back there. Um, and uh, whereas, whereas DC Vertigo has never been in any trouble. You know, they've always been trundling along fine. And, and uh, so, yeah, you, necessarily what you see coming out of the Vertigo house is a lot more experimental, a lot more, you know, a lot more varied. Whereas, yeah, Marvel do tend to concentrate on what their core properties are and where they can really sell big. Um, as to the rest, I never worked for them, um, but I'm told again it, it really does. It really does hinge on numbers because they've got to make the numbers. That's the thing, and it's a declining field as well. That's the problem. The the individual comic books are selling less and less. People aren't buying them anymore in the same numbers. So uh, yeah, it's a bit tense. I think. Did that answer the question at all? Was that, yeah. <laughs> well, um, here. I got this question for you, actually. Um, <coughs> uh, the, the thing with Black Widow, actually, is like uh, you renew character. Um, I don't uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the thing is, uh, before you with Black Widow, Actually, uh, it was just like this spy, uh, old-fashioned spy game with mm -hmm. Nick Fury and all the S.H.I.E.L.D. stuff. Mm -hmm. And after uh, you met with 
a little bit with this uh, angle of the duality between uh, uh, communist, Soviet, and, and stuff. Uh, this bring to the character so much de depth, so much um, entertainment because of the um, shocking ideology in in this du uh, this duality. Actually, um, do you feel like uh, this is a continuous stuff? Uh, it's a, there is a continuation in in this idea because I've sorry, seen. Sorry, could you repeat? Is there? Do you, do you believe, do you feel that this idea you bring to the character, that's the, that this duality of ideology and this uh, inner uh, trouble uh, in, inside her, do you feel like this is a continuation, there is a continuation in this idea? or uh, Because uh, the late books, uh, I've, I've already uh, read some of 2009, maybe 12 and stuff. Um, it's centered around Black Widow. She's a huge thing right now because of the Avengers and stuff. Yeah. But uh, the ideology stuff, it's laid down, it's uh, so blurry right now. So do you feel? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't really think about it at the time, but I seem to have, I seem to have been lucky in that I do seem to have left some tracks. Uh, and some of the stuff that came up, especially some of the stuff that came up in the movies, Somebody said to me, "Oh, yeah, that's you know that that's that's your idea from um, there was this thing that she can't have children, um, which caused a bit of an outcry when when the film came out and uh, and everyone's saying, yeah, yeah, you thought of that, didn't you? So I was in trouble. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it, it does appear that some of what I did sort of stuck to the wall after all, and and and, and then did get recycled, which is nice. Um, I did try and give depth to the character, yes." Um, and I think I succeeded in giving her so much depth that her fan base ended up hating her. Um, by and large, the, um, the, the comic book crowd don't like too much depth in their women. Um, you know, they like a depth of cleavage. They like that. Um, but unfortunately, and you know, it grieves me to say it, but I think unfortunately we're still really dealing with a, a, a mainstream that is interested with female characters in tits and ass. That's what they want. Um, and even in my, my stuff, the artwork still tended in that direction, you know, where we didn't really beat that. Um, what they didn't want was, it seems to me, is angst. Uh, so they really shouldn't have hired me. Um, uh, and I, what I tried to do was to give her conflict, you know, internal conflicts, because we all have them. Uh, and I look back through what had been done with her before, and there seemed to be two dynamics. And one dynamic was that she's the Marvel Universe bike. Every time a superhero needs to get laid, you, you bring in the Black Widow. Um, and that felt a bit unfair. Um, and then the second thing seems to be that there is this constant conflict between, between her femininity and, you know, and then the fact that she's a superhero. And that didn't make much sense to me because if, if you know, the story is she grows up a super spy for the KGB, it's like, Jesus Christ, do you know what those guys used to do? Um, you know, any conflict that she had will be really deeply buried and she wouldn't be agonizing about it. And the, one of the stories that I was sent to look at beforehand had her all upset because on her birthday, the only person who remembered was her dentist who sent her a thing saying, it's your birthday, you need to get in touch and get your teeth looked at. Um, and she was, you know, upset because no one remembered her birthday. And it's like, fuck's sake, man, she's a killer. <laughs> you know, this is, and, and so this, it seemed to me that there was a total lack of empowerment. Um, and of course, I was, a, I was a bit of an innocent. I hadn't done much, I hadn't done any comic book work and I hadn't really read comics very much either. So it was, I was bemused by this. Um, I just couldn't understand it. And so, the, the, you know, for me, the drill became right. We just basically give her all the agency and angst that you would give to Batman or um, Wolverine. Wolverine, say some, you know, characters, male characters who are, you know, they carry their angst around in a fucking backpack. You know, there's so much of it. And I thought, well, we just give her that because I thought it was a natural thing. And it's again, the audience just reacted against it. They didn't like it. Um, some of the people who actually, I mean, apparently my, my editor told me. I don't know, in the comic, I don't know how many of you have read it, but there's a scene in which she goes into combat against these two sort of truck stop assholes um, because they're molesting a young girl, this is a teenage girl. And 
the Black Widow sort of just says to them, okay, look, leave her alone. And they go, and there's a lot of sort of chest beating. And then she says, if you don't leave her alone, neither of you will ever walk again. Um, the fight develops, and we had um, Bill Sinkovich on this, so he did this awesome multi-panel fight, which it, I, I, you know, I'm not worthy. Um, and uh, so she kills one of them, and the other guy is just, is just down and out. And her sidekick, who is this seedy private eye guy called Phil Dexter, he's saying, come on, we've got to get out of here, we've got to get out of here. And she goes, just, just a minute, I keep my promises. And she breaks the guy's spine at the waist so that he will never walk again, because this is what she said she would do. Oh my God, you should have seen the, uh, the, 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 the waves that this made. My editor, Jenny Lee, she had to fight that battle all the way up to VP level in Marvel. I mean, she went all the way up to the, v the vice president of Marvel, who, who kind of looked at it and went, yeah, all right, do it. Um, she came back to me, we're gonna do it. Oh, that is awesome. Start putting it together. And, um, and then at some point, someone suddenly goes, oh, hang on a minute, there's a knife in this. Yeah, there's a knife in it. That's how she, you know, she severs the spine at the waist with, with the knife. No, we can't have that. You said we could do this. No, no, you can do it, but you can't do it with a knife. And Jenny comes, calls me and tells me this, and I'm like, we can break his spine, but we can't do it with a knife. Uh, am I right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Use a fork. So, yeah, I'm trying to think <laughs> of a way to fix this. And, um, and anyway, so in the end, I just went, all right, well, you know, she can do it by main force. So basically, I just had the idea that she would just bear down on his spine at the appropriate point and, and just snap like that, you know. And Bill Sinkovich came along and put this fantastic finish on it with her face is distorted with the effort of it, so she looks demonic almost. Um, and it's kind of full of splinter bits and pieces in the air as well. As this, this, and, and it is the most violent panel in the entire comic. <laughs> um, and... And then what happened was that, yeah, a lot of people reacted against that. They were very, very, very upset by it. And one of the guys in Marvel who worked there as in a sort of editing capacity, who wrote some Black Widow stories back in the day, he approached Jenny Lee in the corridor and he said, of course, Natasha would never do anything like that. <laughs> and, and, and I started to see what a, an immense sense of... Uh, <laughs> what an immense sense of ownership there was uh, of the character, male ownership, you know. Uh, and there was this, which to be honest with you, was, is a perfect metaphor for, for what women live in reality as well, you know. There is this sense of ownership that you have, the male gaze owns you, your, your husband to some extent owns you, your expectations of you are derived from male mentality. Um, so this sense of ownership, it was, it was amazing, but that, that was the problem, that basically the fan base, such as they were, had this had this um, this sense that they owned this character, and therefore, you know, she couldn't really step out of out of she couldn't do anything particularly extreme. Uh, she couldn't have too much depth because that would ruin the ownership. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just broke that. I just went to well, I'm, I don't care. I'm doing this anyway. But as you as you say, as as the numbers tell, it just didn't fly because uh, that's not what people in superhero comics want from their female characters. They do not want angst. They do not want grit. Uh, they do not want a, a sense of instability and danger because that was the other thing I wanted you to be frightened of this woman. All the protagonists I've ever written, you are you should be scared of them. Even if they're being nice to you, you should be scared. Uh, and I wanted that from her as well. And they didn't like that because it made them uneasy. Um, you know. And so, yes I, yes, I think I gave her depth. Yes, some of that depth seems to have stuck. Um, but it was catastrophic in terms of allowing me to continue the story. You know, it, uh, did I answer the question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. God, thank God for that. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> hi for me. Um, I also have two questions first for me for Irena. Um, since you're probably more familiar than many of us with the Spanish comic scene, can you single out a particular trend that's important in Spanish comics? Like, does it try to imitate what he said about Marvel <laughs> and DC, or do you feel like some other topic is important? And I will also ask for Richard, and then oh. you can answer. Um, well, do you want to go first? No, no, I have to think about it. So. I'll, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Audit too. Um, after you worked 
on those graphic novels and comic books. Have you felt in your novel writing that you miss some of the opportunities that the comic medium affords to you? So have you felt that any character's personal journey of yours or some subplot would work better as, as a graphic novel or as comics? Because sometimes the comic medium can help the reader through a story by mm. just visuals. Yeah. Mm. Um, but particularly in science fiction, it sometimes maybe takes away from the imagination um, <clears throat> by imposing to the reader some particular I don't, uh, I image. Don't think, I don't think I took away anything from it that, that, went, that I then poured into my, um, my prose. Um, I'm pretty cinematic in style anyway. I mean, most of, an enormous amount of my inspiration has come from cinema, and I think anyone who reads my stuff will see that. It's, it's very visual. Um, I have to usually go back with my novels afterwards and insert other senses. So, uh, he's standing in a field of corpses, we better have some smell here, you know, because I have forgotten that along the way, first time round. I'm very, very visual in that sense. So that didn't really, you know, I was already there. I didn't, that didn't change. Um, comic book... Comic book writing, there is a discipline to it that I don't have when I'm writing prose because you, you've got to get it down. You know, you've got 22 pages, um, five to seven panels a page. That's it. You've got to get it in somehow. And if you read The Black Widow, especially the first arc, you're going to see that some of it feels a bit cramped visually uh, because I basically just was running out of panels to use. Um, so I think I learned a certain amount of discipline, uh, which maybe, maybe... I applied when I went back to novel writing. Um, but apart from that, no, not really. I mean, it is a, a fairly separate form, and it's, it's not that transferable. Um, as I said, the, the real power of comics comes from this visual impact, and you can't really do that in prose. It was very difficult to, anyway. Um, so so I would get, I'd say, on balance, probably not, but the, the, the discipline of, of the form was probably helpful in turning me into a better human being and, uh, <laughs> and writer. I had to get my cheat sheet, so... <laughs> um, for the Spanish uh, comic books, I had, had an opportunity to uh, translate. Um, when I, I, was, I was just reading about uh, uh, Spanish fiction in general recently, and I, I got a feeling that Spanish fiction, science fiction and fantasy, not just related to comics, is very, very satirical in, in nature. And I actually had an opportunity to translate uh, uh, Historias Negras, uh, which, which are very, very satirical, uh, short, short stories that end up, end up being very dark, and they, and they have dark twist. And also I translated uh, uh, Alfonso Fons, Quentus de un futuro imperfecto, que they're also kind of satirical, dark, edgy in that kind of way. That, that's what I got for the Spanish side of, of, of comic book, uh, in science, science fiction comic books. As for the Latin American, because I mostly translate Latin American comic books, um, they, were, um, they were very... Um, how to say that, um, poetic, very, uh, not just in the written part, uh, also in the graphic part. They were very elaborate, uh, elaborately uh, drawn and uh, written. So it was very challenging to translate them, but also very uh, beautifully written. The words, you, you get to, you know, sing the song along with the author. So, um, things like uh, uh, El, Peregrino, uh, El Peregrino de las Estrellas, uh, Alvar Mayor, and those kinds of, you know, the, the, the comics, yeah. Those kinds, of, those kinds of comics are very, very beautiful just to see and just to, to, to read. So, um, I, I would highly recommend those kinds of, if you have to, if you can find them in, in, in translation, because we had in Croatia opportunity, uh, we, had, we have a a very good uh, publisher called Fibra, and the, the man who runs uh, the, the publishing house, he chooses himself uh, the very best of the best of comic books from all over the world, not just America, Latin America. So I highly recommend them. I can put it in, <laughs> in writing for you if you want to. Um, uh, hi, I have a question back to the 
really, really basic stuff about uh, science fiction and comics. Uh, currently, what it seems to me that the trend, uh, not just the superheroes, is that every comic is basically just a concept for a movie. Mm -hmm. So uh, even the Marvel, I think, uh, moved to the movies from the comics. The comics are only the base for the movie now, or for the uh, TV series or the Marvel Universe. Uh, I even know, I heard the rumors about some comics like The Cowboy and Aliens that are basically written to be sold as a movie. They were sold as a movie before they were even published as a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay, the comic books obviously made a huge influence on the, on the movies and on the TV. Do you maybe see some sort of a kickback uh, that uh, all this uh, congestion of the comic book materials uh, in, the, in the movies, uh, do you maybe see it influencing the comics back as some sort of a, I don't know, snapshot or something? Well, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, in some way, you know, from a point of view of consumption, it's a virtuous circle because obviously the movies popularize the, the, the characters and the IPs and then that in turn sells more comics. So it, it, it sort of feeds on itself. Um, I personally think it's been pretty disastrous for cinema um, I, because I, I think we've reached a point where there's a kind of narrowing of what people are prepared to invest money in in, uh, in, in terms of movies. And the stories that we seem prepared to tell on the big screen seem to be getting less and less interesting. Um, also less and less grown up, because that is the other problem, that because these, because these movies are part of an IP that is really targeting kids of about eight to 10 years old, um, it's really about selling toys as much as anything. Um, this limits what you can do in the movies. Um, you, you're, you're sort of stuck at a certain very immature level of, of, uh, of, na of narration. Uh, there's a certain limit on vi violence, there are certain limits on how much sexuality you can put into it. Um, and the other thing, of course, with, the, with the, the big Marvel and DC properties is you can't fucking kill these people. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, this movie, I, I think I tweeted about this, this movie, Civil War. Right, okay, um, how many of the participating superheroes will be killed by the end of this civil war or horribly maimed, as tends to happen to people fighting in wars? None. Uh, one guy ends up with a dodgy leg or something, doesn't he? I, uh, it, and this is the problem. You can't kill Batman or Superman, you know. Uh, so I, there was a little bit of interest when um, Batman versus Superman came out. I thought, oh, you know, thematically this could go into some, into some interesting places. But the problem is you can't kill these characters. So there's never any resolution. At the end of a superhero movie, you have to end up more or less where you were before. Um, or, or you can kill them and then bring them back to life and then kill them again and then do, back right? to exactly. life. Exactly. So, so you, you, the, you're losing a kind of, I mean, I remember reading an essay by Thomas Pynchon many years ago as the introduction to his, his collection of short stories where he said, and he was talking, interestingly enough, specifically about science fiction, and he said, I think the big problem that science fiction has in terms of maturing as a genre is that it doesn't deal with death. And I, I feel that that charge was a little unfair even back then, but I know what he means. Um, and this is doubly the case with the superhero dynamic. You know, the, death is just not on the menu. Um, and you can't really tell a human story unless death is included in it in some, some shape or form. So I haven't been to see any of the Avengers movies uh, because of that, because I'm just like, I'm not interested. I know none of these people are going to get badly hurt. It's like watching movies about a schoolyard scuffle. You know, and to be honest with you, that's what it is. It's, there's a lot of leaping into the air and waving fists and sort of colliding. Um, but when they all pick themselves up at the end, it's like the A-team. <laughs> You remember the A-Team, yeah? The, 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 sort of the worst moment in, in, in visual narrative history ever. When I still remember watching the first episode, and I'd, I'd, it replaced Starsky and Hutch, right, uh, on British TV. And Starsky and Hutch was quite hard-boiled back in the day. Uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. And suddenly this A-Team thing came, and I thought it looked good because there were ch jeep chases and explosions and guys with machine guns. And I thought, hey, this is, this is going to be cool. I mean, I was, what, 12 or something. Um, and when it dawned on me that no one died, that like, so the, the, the Jeep blows up, it's turned upside down, and then all the bad guys crawl out going, ah, oh, damn, that was, uh, it, you know, it became, it was shit, it, quite literally, it just, it, 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 was, it was, 
I don't know. It was it was narrative de boycao. You know, it just it breaks <laughs> it breaks down into nothing. Um, and this is this is the big problem. I think uh, you're feeding. Sure, you're feeding a, a consumer habit. You're feeding an IP. But what you end up with is this just this big ball of nothing. Um, you, you you're not going to move anybody because they know these characters can't really be hurt. Um, you know, I, I really think it's time we just basically executed all the superheroes and, and, and did something else. Uh, but of course, <laughs> that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I, I hate superhero movies, except Deadpool, okay? But uh, I was just thinking about how uh, a lot of comics are translating into, or being translated into movies, but uh, there's not a lot of going in the other way. But I thought of uh, uh, my favorite shows, Firefly and Buffy, who continued as comic books, uh, as a sort of low budget uh, <laughs> series. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know, uh, we, don't, we don't get to call it a trend because I can just think of these two, but Maybe sometimes in the future we, we get to see, uh, uh, you know, translation into comics of the favorite shows, maybe favorite movies that uh, become uh, obsolete or something like that. So that, that's, that's the only thing that came up to my mind. To, to be fair, I'm now going to completely reverse and say something positive. Um, I, was, I was told not long ago by some guy who works in, in the sort of the DC thing that... Um, I think, is it Warner? I think Warner own DC now. Um, and and the, apparently they love it because what they said, what we have in DC and Vertigo is essentially um, a laboratory. We can, because comic books and um, storyboarding for a movie are very, very similar. Um, and, you know, the only thing that really is different is the quality of the art and the, and the, you know, the attention to the detail that goes into the comic because it's a finished product. So the guys in War Warner are apparently very happy because you can produce a six-issue comic book run of some new IP for very little money in film terms. You know, you can put it out there for a few hundred thousand dollars and then you can see if it sinks or swims. And, and then if it does well, then the movie executives go, oh, well, you know, there seems to be a market for this. Maybe we can maybe do something with this. So to that extent, I guess comics are a very useful tool for, for, for bringing in new IPs. I just wish there was more money focused on doing that. Uh, you know, and I, I don't really feel there is. You, you could argue that... Um, what's that movie with the raccoon in it? Um, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, I think that's one that owes its existence to exactly that dynamic, the fact that it worked as a comic, and so someone went, yeah, we can turn this into a movie. And you know what? It worked really well. So it's not all bad news. I, I don't okay, know. If, so, I, I just read somewhere that uh, the, the big studios have lined up uh, superhero movies until, like, 20. 30 or something, so they're, they're not going to die so soon. Okay, um, I hate to do this to all of you, but <laughs> we ran out of time. I know everyone has questions. Myself, I have questions like, uh, what's with the rubber duck? But <laughs> <laughs> we need to go. <laughs> Thank you so much to Richard and Irena and everyone here for being here, and let's give a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.